Our text comes from the New Testament Gospel of St. Matthew, the 16th chapter, and this is verses 13 down to verse 20. It's typically known as Peter's Confession. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in, be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Amen. Amen. Who do you believe Jesus really is? I'll begin with the location of the story. That's critical. It happened in in an area, a region known as Caesarea Philippi. This would have been a long ways from Jerusalem, the the headquarters, the capital, the center of religious activities. Caesarea Philippi is actually quite a bit north of where most of the stories of the Gospels take place. Right on the southwest corner of Mount Hermon. In this area, it was really a, a convergence of all sorts of thought, all sorts of theology. It was recognized by a number of people as kind of a holy center of worship. For the ancient Syrians that, 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 that lived in that region, it was the place by which they would worship the god Baal. Bill, as you know and remember, is the guy, the god of the sky, the god of rain, the god of thunder. And archaeologists that have gone into this area have found at least 14 different temples that were dedicated by these people to the god Baal. It was still recognized in Jesus' day as a place. The ancient Greeks also saw the value of this particular location. There was a large hillside with an open cave. And according to Greek understanding, it was the birthplace of the god Pan. Remember Pan? It was with the flute. Pan was the god of fields and forests, of mountains, sheep, and goats. It was also a place that the Romans felt as a place of, of worship. There it was Herod the Great, the the leader there at the time of Jesus' birth, that he dedicated a temple to Caesar, to honor Caesar, that the emperor's court uh, uh, prospect of worship was also located there, that whether you be uh, uh, the Syrian background or the Greek or the Roman, it became a center of worship. And then, of course, you have the Jewish belief. That area of land was given to Joseph's son Manasseh, part of the double portion of the, as it was divided up after uh, the, the, they came in to take the land. But the key critical port, part of the story for Jewish worship was that this very region was the source of the River Jordan. It was the River Jordan that was the life-giving water for the people. That the mountains, as they would the, the collect up on top of Mount Hermon, the, the snow, as it would run down the mountain and create these little tributaries and streams that would create then this river, it represented life, the lifeblood 
of Israel. And it's this place, far away again from Jerusalem and all the theologians there, that Jesus pulls his disciples apart from everyone, and he asks them this question. Who do people say is the Son of Man? Who is the Son of Man? Now, even that question is a little bit loaded. Because the phrase Son of Man was a hotly debated conversation point among the Jewish people of Jesus' day. It goes back to a passage that's found in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. In chapter 7, verse 13, it describes in this prophetic uh, conversation that Daniel records a vision that he had in which one comes from heaven, from God, who is given all authority, all glory, all power on earth and over the earth that all people of all lands would worship forever. And his title is the Son of Man. And so as disciples heard Jesus ask the question, they began to, 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 to give the speculations of, of the theologians and the common conversations. You know, everybody has a thought. Everyone has a theory. Everyone has something that they're thinking about. And for some of them, oh, it's got to be John the Baptist. He's our contemporary, and he's, he's a prophet of God. Maybe it's John. For others, they went back to one of the great prophets of old. They went back to Elijah or some to even Jeremiah, and others, they just said, hey, it's just got to be one of the prophets. We're not sure who it is. But then Jesus does something powerful. He pulls aside Peter. Again, Peter always was the, the impulsive one. Peter was always, you know, he wasn't necessarily given the title as the chief of the, of the disciples, but he seemed like he just gravitated towards that top spot. He always was the one that seemed to, to, to be there at all the important points. And Jesus did that amazing thing where he asked him particular, what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? It's a great question. As we think about the, the signs of spiritual vitality, the vital signs, we all have a belief structure, mental, spiritual grid that we live with in our minds. As we've grown up, as we have developed in our homes and our experiences and our level of, level of education, we create this grid. It was, it's Mike Flynn in his book, The Power-Based Life, that he describes this structure, this grid, as a means to help us, to guard us as we, we take new data and information and place it into this, this construct. We might call that our worldview. But there's also this aspect as we think about our world in which we have a moral value structure to whether we see something as good or something that is bad, something that is important, something that is not important. And that structure can be based on a wide different thing, various things that we come. For some people, that structure is influenced a lot about the key people in our lives, parents, grandparents, teachers, pastors, political leaders. They help mold and shape that structure. Sometimes it's popular thought, religious belief, uh, being brought up in church and hearing the, the stories that are of, of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It could be a, a, a number of different things that we have developed this grid within our minds, and I'll call that grid our belief structure. And when we are faced with new things, different things that come across and, 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 and challenge us, we try to interpret that within this structure, which is still changing, but it's there. 
And what Jesus was doing with Peter was really saying, okay, you have followed me for these number of years. When I remember standing there on the seashore of, of, of the Sea of Galilee, dear, the boat's still right there, and I stood before you and I said, Peter, come, follow me. Yeah, I'll make you fishers of men. Peter left it all to go follow Jesus. He did that because he had a belief that Jesus was more than just the ordinary person, more than just someone that was just passing by that has an interesting little difference. No, he made a huge commitment to follow. And so now Jesus is asking him specifically, who really am I? Peter's confession was straight up, straightforward, and within his understanding, he clearly declared that Jesus was the Messiah. And he added something. The Son of the living God. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. Did you, did you just hear that? I want you to think about this for just a moment. Peter looks to Jesus, to his response. Jesus gave the first thing, well, the Son of Man. Well, that's a, who is the Son of Man? And they gave all these, 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 these speculations. But then Jesus said, Peter, what about, who am I? Who am I to you? His response was, you're it. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one. You're the Christ. Son of the living God. That's big. The question for all of us here today, when we think about this person of Jesus and we take it in this belief grid that we have, who is Jesus to you? Is he someone that you've heard about, maybe that you've heard others preach or teach or you've, you've watched documentaries, you've read about it, you're, you know what he says, it says in Wikipedia? You might have be piggybacking your faith on a parent's faith, a grandparent's faith that were people that loved God and loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's tons of speculations. If I were to ask you or anyone were to ask you, who is Jesus? You said, well, uh, he was a historical figure that lived back, you know, the first century. Or that uh, he was uh, the, the, the founder of a movement called Christianity or a number of these things. And we would probably be very accurate as far as that. But that's not really what Jesus asked. He says, Peter, who am I to you? His response was, you're Messiah. You're the Christ, which literally means the anointed one, son of the living God. And his response back to Peter brings this, this, this profession, this confession, this conviction in which he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, Peter Petra, which is rock, and upon this rock, and there's a matter of interpretation there, I will build my church. And I, as, a, as a theologian and as one who's been, you know, studied this, there, there's a little interesting wordplay here between the, the, the Peter, whose, whose name here means rock, and upon the, the rock, we're seeing that the, the rock Peter will be built upon the solid rock Jesus. But I believe, and of course in Catholicism, this is the basis of the papacy of, of, of Peter. But I truly believe that the rock that he's speaking about here is a level of conviction. It is upon this solid conviction that you have that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you will build the church. It's a sense of belief that I'm not just an ordinary guy. I'm not just cool hanging out here with you guys. I'm not just the one that's the healer, the teacher, the wandering nomadic prophet. No, I'm, I'm the one that was foretold. I am the promised one. I am the living God. And it's that profession, it's that acceptance, that conviction that becomes the basis by which the church will be victorious. 
in which he says that the gates of hell or Hades will not overcome it or prevail against it, that it can't withhold it. And that when you, as a key to the kingdom, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound and whatever loosened will be loosened in heaven, it's because of this conviction of, that you have. And it is, I recognize this, a matter of personal faith to trust in this confession as your own. Who is Jesus to you? When I was a little kid, I grew up in church. My mom and dad took us to church uh, uh, quite a bit. And I remember the time in my life, as just a nine-year-old kid, that that question really came first and foremost to myself. Who is Jesus? I could tell you the Bible stories at nine years old. I knew a lot about Christ from vacation Bible schools and, and all the sermons and things that I'd heard. But there was one particular message one day at church that the preacher asked, which really came down to me. Who is Jesus to you, to me, a nine-year-old kid? And at that time, I, 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 I just said, listen, I want Christ to be mine. I opened up my heart and my mind, and I invited Christ to be the Son of God, Messiah, Savior, Lord, the living God. It was genuine, and it was real. And as a minister, it was years later that God called me into the ministry. I was about 18 years old, my first year of college, looking at my life ahead. And I don't come from a line of ministers. You know that some people, yeah, the grandpa was a pastor, and dad's a pastor, and I'm a pastor, and my kids probably, I wasn't that way at all. Uh, my dad's electrician mechanic, very much get your hand dirty kind of guy. And I uh, didn't have ministers at all, but I truly felt, a, 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 it wasn't a great voice speaking to me, but it was that conviction of who Jesus was that says, Craig, I think I'm calling you into ministry. And as a pastor over the course of, of these years of my life, I've shared the message of Jesus. Recently, I was at a, a conference, and there was a, a speaker that asked this question. And I'll ask it here as we begin to wrap up the service. If there was something that you're holding precious in value, a belief, that someone came to you and they could clearly define that it was not true, that it would completely change and alter your world view, what would that core value be? Now, I, I never really heard things phrased in that way, but the lesson for us to think and ponder was really an attempt to get back to this fundamental question. What is at the center of your core structure? That, that if, if the pillars of that were to be knocked out, that everything else would fall. For some, it might be your belief in a family, or for some, it might be a political, or it might be a an abstract construct of some sort that, that, that kind of guides your life. But for Peter, it was this profession of Jesus. And that's, I think, true with myself as well. And it's a question about yours. Now let's just wrap this up by talking about Peter just a few more moments. He made this great profession. Jesus tells the rest of the disciples, you know, hey, God has given this to Peter. I don't want you to take this part of the message and use it to proclaim because God will speak to each person in their own way at their own time. Don't make that the first thing you run into town. The Messiah is here. That will come. But can you imagine then Peter, who had this sense of conviction, this sense of belief, then how it completely unraveled when he watched Jesus die on the cross? Well, wait a second now. This is not what I thought. As he saw him dragged away, and that's the reason why the, I think the despair, even the denial, I mean, his whole world was being twisted upside down. His sense of convictions, his belief was being shattered, and they're taking Jesus away, and they're crucifying him, and he died. And that's why when Jesus rose from the dead, it was so much of a restoration of his conviction. Yes! 
I did have my faith in the right person. He has risen from the dead. He is alive. That 40 days later, he preached the powerful message of conviction and authority on the day of Pentecost of that person of Christ. It's also, if you study the rest of Peter's life, while this lowly fisherman rose to the great place within the church and is described as having a martyr's death for his faith. None of us may be ever called to suffer in any kind of manner, shape, or form, but the conviction level is just as real today. My question this morning is, who is Jesus to you? Let us pray. Father God, Lord, this is part of our world today with the different thoughts and theories and beliefs. We understand. But this is an intensely personal question. It's between God and each individual. I'm posing it, Father, but I'm posing it as from Scripture, but it's really your message to each person. I pray that each person at this moment and this day will look within themselves to answer that question and that you might reveal to them the power, the beauty, the love, the acceptance, the grace, the forgiveness, the joy which is found in the gift of Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.